Well, good evening, church history fans. Uh, welcome, welcome. It is my joy to welcome you this evening as we begin the discussion of diving into Mark Staker's book, Harking O Ye People, the Historical Setting of Joseph Smith's Ohio Revelations. Uh, this is an excellent book, all 600 pages of it, and I am thrilled that we're gonna dive into it this evening. Now, before we begin talking about Kirtland, I want you all to be among the first to hear about our next online program. The spring lecture series begins on Thursday, April 14th and runs through June 2nd. We have eight awesome speakers exploring eight fascinating topics. And I'm gonna do a quick screen share so you can see some of those topics. Um, as I mentioned, we have eight speakers sharing eight different topics from church history in this online lecture series. So here's a sneak peek on what to expect uh, this spring. We're gonna begin with uh, Eric Paul Rogers, who'll tell the story of Mark Hill Forscott. Uh, Forscott was a, a missionary, an apostle, and an RLDS minister. It's a fascinating story. And so that'll be on April 14th. While the next week, Andrew Bolton will uh, drop by and share the story of Charles Derry, a reorganization missionary in the British Isles. On April 28th, uh, Tony Shavala Smith will present doctrinal self-definition and the construction of an RLDS theological identity. Uh, for theology fans, this is a lecture you don't want to miss. On May 5th, our friend Michael Wright uh, we'll stop by and share the story of John Avendet, the first Italian missionary of the reorganization. Then on uh, May 12th, Kees Olegisma will talk about community of Christ history in the Netherlands. On May 19th, our friend Keith Wilson will drop by and share the story of Clifford Cole. Uh, his Lecture is titled Clifford A. Cole, Architect and Refounder of the Modern Community of Christ. That's sure to be a good lecture. Then on May 26, we'll hear from William Moore, who will bring out the preaching charts in the Community of Christ collection and talk about the history and message behind some of these historic preaching charts. Maybe some of you in attendance uh, remember running across a preaching chart or two. Uh, his lecture is entitled, Pleasing to Look Upon and Easy to Understand, RLDS Preaching Charts, Their History and Usage. And finally, the spring lecture series will wrap up with Sherry Mesley Moraine, one of my favorite presenters. Sherry's going to talk about the story behind the Lamoni Might Society in a lecture called, What Were the Women to Do? It's going to be a, a fabulous lecture series. And you can register for the lecture series tonight um, by going to our website, historicsitesfoundation.org. You'll see on the homepage um, information about the spring lecture series. So I hope you'll join us this spring. We have a lot of church history to discuss. The winter book series and our upcoming spring lecture series would not be possible without your generous support. Donations received during the winter and spring series support the ongoing maintenance and preservation needs of all five Community of Christ historic sites. Thank you all for helping preserve church heritage. I also want to take a moment to introduce you to a few folks who are joining us here tonight. Seth Bryant is joining us from Kirtland, Ohio, and he will serve as our host this evening. Welcome, Seth. Good to have you here. Thank and from you. Nauvoo, we have Lachlan Mackay, who will serve as a co-host tonight, and he'll help manage things from behind the scenes. So thank you so much, Lach, for joining us tonight. So I'll now turn the microphone over to you, Seth, to share the plan for the evening and tell us about our guest historian. All right. Well, I'm very excited to be here and always excited to talk about church history with Locke and Barb. And then I absolutely love this book and love uh, Mark Staker's work. So super excited about this discussion. All right. So tonight we are going to be hearing from Mark Staker on his book, Harkin OU People, the historical setting for Joseph Smith's Ohio Revelations. So the schedule was just posted in the chat. 
we look forward to questions from the audience, which you can post in the Q&A. So notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A and then there's a chat. You'll wanna put your questions into that uh, Q&A feature. And then uh, once Mark has concluded, then we'll go and we'll answer those questions. So without further delay, let me introduce our speaker. Mark Staker was awarded a doctorate in medical anthropology in 1992. His fieldwork in the former Dutch colony of Suriname focused on the use of Vinti in traditional healing context. Vinti being an Afro-Caribbean tradition similar to the better known Vodun. But he also studied East Indian, Indonesian, and Chinese populations in the same communities. Because of his broad international exposure, Mark was hired by the Museum of Church History and Art in Salt Lake City to develop exhibits addressing an international audience of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The press of assignments focused on 19th century America, however, and he found his, himself increasingly addressing church history in its early decades. For the past 25 years, Mark has been restoring and interpreting historic sites and drawing on his interest in how people live to reconstruct daily life in early America. His latest book was just published by John Whitmer Books titled Joseph and Lucy Smith's Tunbridge Farm, an archeological and landscape study. So thank you, Mark, for taking time to be here tonight to share with us about Kirtland. Uh, as someone who used your book on a daily, if not uh, hourly basis over the summer with uh, people with so many questions and I'd often go and and say, look, the answer is right here and you should buy this book. Uh, I'm just really excited to hear your presentation tonight as I'm sure we all are. So the time is yours. Thank you. I appreciate being uh, invited. You don't know how, uh, how exciting this is for me to be a part of, of your activity this evening. Let me... Um, I've got three options here, so we will see if I can get this going right. Uh, when Barb called me and asked me if I could um, could share some things, uh, can you see? Am I am I good? Looks great. Great, thank you. It's not in the presenter mode, though. We're able to see what the next slide is. Oh. All right, let me let me do this again. It's given me a lot of options here, so we'll go this way. Okay, when Barb um, invited me to share uh, some things this evening, and I um. I happened to be reading uh, a little bit of uh, stuff uh, from an author that I don't really read, but she had just passed away, Joan Didion. Um, and I happened to have known her nephew who was doing a biography, uh, a video biography on her that I met at a conference on writing biography. And uh, so I was thinking about her work um, when I was thinking about Kirtland. And she had drawn a couple of her titles from a poem. And so I uh, selected that poem kind of to, to shape my themes ar around. I, I don't know if you've read uh, William Butler Yeats' uh, poem, The Second Coming. And he's not a Christian and he's a little uh, cynical um, in some areas. So I think as Christians, uh, th those of us who are Christians uh, would probably not uh, draw entirely from uh, what he's saying or feel comfortable with it, but I wanted to share with you some, some of his thoughts because it, I've, uh, I'm gonna return to it, uh, where he says, turning and turning in the wild, the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand, the second coming. And what rough beast that's hour come round at last, vouches toward Bethlehem to be born. Um, he saw something terrible coming at the, the second Bethlehem, but 
the point I wanted to, to focus on here was that idea of that things fall apart, that the center cannot hold, that it seems that there's this constant tension between community and coming together and individualism and uh, kind of splitting apart or dividing. And Kirtland uh, exhibits that very well. Um, I, uh, the other thought that came to me as I was uh, thinking about tonight, um, my Irish grandmother would have been proud that it was on um, St. Patrick's Day, but she came from uh, Northern Ireland, from Belfast, and had not kind of things to say about her husband and the other men in her community who uh, she did not consider to be true Christians because uh, they did what she called unspeakable things in the name of Christianity. And uh, there's this tension that we see every night now in the news uh, between people who should be drawing very close, Ukrainians and Russians uh, have so much in common and yet, um, and yet have, are so far apart. So uh, with that idea, uh, my background, having, uh, as Seth mentioned, having done my field work in Suriname, as I began to approach the Kirtland material, there were certain themes that uh, came out to me uh, that, I, that I was particularly drawn to. I had never had a class in church history. Nobody had ever told me how to interpret all this data. I was just reading it for the very first time as I read through these sources. And so I looked at it maybe from fresh eyes, from, certainly from my own eyes and from anthropological eyes, as I tried to sort out uh, the Kirtland experience for people. And one of the things that I was drawn to was the individuals um, and their experiences in Kirtland. Uh, I was asked by Glenn Leonard, uh, who had responsibility for historic sites of the, of the earliest church. Um, one day, uh, he came to, to me and said, will you uh, take uh, responsibility for, the, for Kirtland? Uh, they had taken a group, some, uh, some missionaries had taken a group of 15 individuals upstairs in the Johnson home. And while they were there, a timber gave out the whole upstairs floor collapsed down more than 12 inches and left a major crack in the ceiling. Uh, they were rushed out of the building and the, the doors were closed and the building was shut down. So if you've gone to a historic structure and you've been disappointed when they say, well, you can't go upstairs, it's not a, a good idea to take a lot of people up there. Now you know that that's coming from experiences such as ours where um, people were taken up and uh, it did not end up well. And if I can put a plug in for donations, um, sometimes a very little bit of money can save uh, very expensive repairs in the future if we can address some of those things up front. And in this case, uh, you can see one of the timbers where a small portion of it that was rotted out uh, was easily replaced um, and it continues to hold uh, part of the structure of the Johnson home up so it won't uh, collapse again in the future. So as you know um, Joseph Smith received a revelation uh, on behalf of his father when he was in Harmony, Pennsylvania where, where the revelation uh, told him to thrust in your sickle with all your might and to bring in a harvest of souls. And I pondered that for a while. It struck me uh, knowing that um, Joseph's father would have used a scythe. And that kind of language was a little unusual. And um, there are biblical references. And so that was part of the experience. But Joseph Smith Sr., when he heard that instruction, he would have understood the sickle as a universal means of harvest. In other words, mostly women use the sickle. Uh, children used it as well. And men as well would go in and get smaller bundles of grain and you could harvest out the good grain and leave the weeds in place. Where a scythe, you think of more as kind of the end times where the wicked and the righteous, you know, you cut the weeds and the grain all at the same time and it all gets cut down. And so, 
that is the experience of the early saints as they arrived in, in, in uh, Kirtland. They were, uh, they came in with their sickles and they're harvesting a few here and a few there. Uh, this is um, a spot on the Morley farm uh, where uh, part of the Morley, Isaac Morley uh, family complex had e existed. And um, the family was a group of at least 17 families that were all trying to live Acts chapter two, as they interpreted it, having all things in common and uh, living the gospel. And they particularly were interested in the gifts of the spirit. Well, one of the members of the Morley family was an individual, um, Peter Kerr is how he's listed in his birth record. Kerr was the slave owner. Uh, and it, I'm confident that he didn't use that last name as he got older. Um, but what last name he did use, I don't know. He called himself Black Pete, and so that's uh, the name I've continued to use for him. Uh, but Black Pete was a member of the Mori family, and he was described as being a prophet among them. Uh, they looked to him for revelation and inspiration and guidance. When the Book of Mormon came to Kirtland uh, through uh, the four missionaries that, that brought it there, um, it anticipated uh, uh, William, um, uh, the, the, the man who introduced abolitionism in, in America um, by two years, uh, Garrison, William Garrison, who uh, began to talk about uh, freedom of slaves and equality of, of blacks in America. Uh, in the, the Book of Mormon talks about all are alike unto God slave and free. And that was a that was a new concept in the United States at the time. But uh, the Morley family had already adopted that idea and uh, they were equal uh, in, in all ways. Well, they looked to Black Pete for uh, inspiration and guidance. His mother uh, was born in Africa. And this was part of the story that was really difficult for me to figure out, but it was one that I was very interested in uh, because of my academic background, primarily and then family background or relatives of mine. Um, I focused heavily on trying to figure out his, his past. And I, I wrote to friends in West Africa and I said, his mother's name is Kino. Uh, what can you tell me about that? And they said, oh, yes, that's a very common name, probably from Senegal, and it means red. Um, so why did she have that name? Don't, don't know. But uh, she was a very rare person. As a matter of fact, in the Pennsylvania records that I looked through, she was the only one that retained her African name. Um, but she would have introduced to her son a religious background that included strong emotional and physical reflections on religion. And um, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about speaking in tongues because I believe, and I try to make that case in the book, the, the idea of speaking in tongues comes from Africans. Uh, it's not, uh, there are some comments about, um, Glossolalia, speaking in tongues, you know, and, and the Shakers and England, but it, the sources just don't seem to be uh, strong. And it seems that that's kind of projected back on that time period. And so when we talk about speaking in tongues early in uh, Kirtland, it seems that that was introduced first by Black Pete. Um, but his mother would have introduced, uh, you know, different kinds of movements and dancing and religion that we see in the Kirtland community initially when the missionaries come. And there are strong uh, feelings against that. And it creates some confusion and some contention in the community. Black Pete lives for a while with the Whitney family. And I don't think it's an accident that Ann Whitney is one of the earliest and the most prolific at speaking in tongues. And that's something that she adopts and <laughs> exhibits uh, 
Joseph Smith encourages that practice uh, with her and um, compliments her on it. Uh, she is interested in kind of connecting with the spirit in that way. But when Joseph arrives, however, um, everybody looks to him for direction. You know, is this good? What, what Black Pete's been uh, teaching us? Is it not good? Um, what should we do about uh, this, uh, this religious enthusiasm, <laughs> as they call it? And Joseph, as you know, receives a revelation on seeking the best gifts and spiritual gifts are outlined in detail uh, from him. And uh, some of those spiritual gifts he talks about are gifts that Black Pete introduced into the community, uh, such as speaking in tongues um, and experiencing the spirit in, in the physical ways and, and physical manifestations. And so I see um, Black Pete uh, just a, a normal member of the church, um, not prominent, doesn't hold any major roles in the, in the community, but he contributes in an important way toward um, the community as a whole. Everybody receives blessings through the questions that he's able to raise and the spiritual manifestations that he introduces. So. Uh, he adds to uh, this larger whole. But there's the contention going on about uh, physical uh, manifestations and about these things. For some reason, and the historical record uh, is silent after kind of that confrontation and that earlier uh, uh, interaction between members and Black Pete. Uh, the, the record is silent as to what happens to him, but he disappears from uh, their community. I like to imagine that um, that he uh, he continued to believe and he went on uh, to accomplish uh, great things, but um, but just kind of fell back into the, into the woodwork, so to speak. Uh, but I suspect that was probably not the case, that there was not uh, a good integration in the community in terms of being actually able to accept everybody and to have the community come together as one whole. So this is the experience of one individual, but there were others as well, um, who as they continued to thrust in their sickle, and to bring others into the harvest, uh, they brought in a, a lot of a lot of different uh, people who contributed to the community. And one of those was uh, Alice Johnson, uh, who went by Elsa. Her her daughter had the same name, so that kept them uh, kept kept pe people clear on who they were talking about. Uh, Alice Johnson had rheumatism, uh, according to her son. Um, it could have been something else, but. Uh, Based on the photograph here, it was her right arm that had problems. Um, at the time uh, they uh, received the Book of Mormon, just that very same time that Black Pete was active, uh, they're reading it in their home and they decide to go, uh, Joseph Smith has arrived and they want to go and ask him if he can do something about her arm. And he does, he uh, blesses her and her arm is healed. Um, obviously from the photograph here, um, it doesn't last for her lifetime, but at least for a period of time, she's able to get back to work. And it's not just her family that gives this account, but uh, others who are not parts of their community, um, who later also mentioned, you know, this, that they, they knew that she had been healed by Joseph Smith. And, it brought her family into, into the church. This is the uh, room in the Whitney home where uh, that experience took place. Uh, we know that the, uh, the mantle is original. It was upstairs in the, uh, when they expanded the upstairs, they used it as a, a support in the roof to raise the roof. Um, we found that it fit in the exact location uh, where we, uh, replaced it. And so we were able to get that mantle back into the room as it originally looked. 
And Joseph Smith, after he blessed her, walked into the kitchen and into the next room and um, left her there as she then experienced um, a miracle in her life. Her family then invited the Smiths to go back and live with them. And that fall in September, um, Isaac Morley sold his farm and he went to Missouri. And so Joseph no longer had a place to stay there. He came down here to the Johnson home and they made a room for him upstairs uh, where uh, he could uh, take care of church business. And uh, they did some remodeling in the home. We were able to find uh, the uh, construction records actually from one of the carpenters who worked on the home to know the exact date that they did that work to accommodate the, uh, Joseph and Emma Smith as they moved into the home. This room was the um, room that uh, Isaac, or, um, John and Elsa Johnson gave up as their bedroom and they moved into another room uh, as it was remodeled. And um, Joseph was able to work in this room. We uh, restored the paint colors. The, the home was left completely intact as it was when the Johnson family lived there. The Stevens family that moved in later painted over uh, the paint colors twice. And so but it was very easy to get back down to those original colors um, and to restore the home as it had looked originally at the time. Um, there were some people concerned about the paint colors. They thought they were uh, too loud and would be too distracting to people. But we felt that uh, they hadn't been distracting to Joseph while he lived here. And so we uh, insisted that the original paint colors uh, be uh, restored and that the home uh, be brought back to its original condition. Uh, the benches aren't, aren't original in this room. They would have been uh, chairs here, but, but um, we're gonna get chairs back in this space. Joseph then, while he's here in this room, he has a vision with Sidney Rigdon where they see um, a lot of different things, including uh, they say uh, the father and the son. That uh, is a blasphemous for some of the people who are in this room. Uh, there are 17 people in here watching while the vision takes place. And um, two of those individuals are brothers of John Johnson that he's invited to come down. Um, and Eli, Eli Johnson and Edward Johnson uh, come here and uh, probably because of the vision, it could have been things beforehand, but at the same time that this happens, they lead the community and begin attacking uh, the things that are being taught here. Uh, they attack Joseph's uh, translation of the Bible, his inspired work there and they attack um, the revelations that he's receiving. And uh, one of their neighbors, uh, Simon's writer, uh, this uh, Hartwell writer, that his name's at the bottom of this image is his son who inherits his father's home. Simon's is an orchard keeper, has apple orchards. You can see the apple trees in the distance uh, that he had planted that his son still maintains 30 years later. And uh, Simons is also a minister, Disciples of Christ minister who left his congregation and um, is involved uh, with Joseph Smith for a while. And he joins in a group who decide they want to stop Joseph and um, some want to kill him. Others want to just uh, drive him away so he leaves their community. They meet here at the Hinckley property uh, down the road. And uh, my guess is Sarah Hinckley is uh, uh, the mother in this home. She remains friends with Eliza Snow, um, a, a, a neighbor of hers who ends up going on to Nauvoo and she sends a cow all the way to Nauvoo to help her, her friend. Um, and um, Sarah Hinckley is probably the source of the information that um, comes uh, from somebody to, to Lyman Johnson or to Luke Johnson, who says that they gather in the back of the home here 
and they darken their faces, they put, put black on their faces and um, try to disguise themselves as they um, go and attack this home where Joseph and Emma are sleeping at night with two adopted children that they have. Now, part of the, uh, the whole reason I ended up writing the book, I did all the research just to help with the restoration and planned on it just going in my files and never ending up anywhere. But there ended up being some sharp disagreements over interpretation of this home. And I don't know if, if I was Irish or if I was Ukrainian, but I felt like I was at the, uh, at the, on the wrong end of the battle in some way. Um, uh, but I got permission to share all my research uh, for people to read and then they could decide for themselves. And so that's how the book ended up coming to be, was I wanted to share the research about where Joseph and Emma were sleeping in the home the night that he was attacked and let people decide for themselves um, what happened. And so I made every effort to share both sides of the story as with the data that I had and with the data that others had argued <laughs> for their perspective so that people could decide for themselves. And so I'm the editor of the book, uh, Levina Fielding Anderson, who edited this book, as I told her that I really wanted to have that uh, data and notice so people could evaluate that, she ended up pulling the appendix that included you know, the maps and the discussion of the data and put it right in the middle of the text of the book. And so that's why as you read that and you find that appendix kind of right there in the book, uh, that was her, her doing uh, to make sure that that was available so people could consider that. So. I hope that uh, those of you who uh, do get a chance to read through the book, I hope that you will look through that and decide for yourself. Consider the data. Um, uh, right now, the official approach is to not interpret where they were sleeping, but it gets interpreted anyway because of a long tradition for another perspective. But um, what I argue is that if you look at the data, uh, Joseph says that he was taken out the door and he didn't come awake until he was on the stoop. And so uh, the two options are either this room or uh, there's one, the, the west part, the northwest corner, so it'd be the upper, uh, upper left-hand corner of this space. There, there's another room that's interpreted as where he's sleeping that would require that he was taken out of bed, taken six feet down the hallway, turn a corner and then take him out on the stoop before he woke up. And it just it didn't seem to me um, that anybody could sleep that soundly, um, particularly since he was uh, left with a bald spot in his hair because they pulled, it was such a violent experience that they pulled some of his hair out while they were pulling him out of bed. And there are a lot of other, I go through a lot of other details um, as with any book, uh, you know, you learn more afterwards and there's some other additional source material that supports that perspective that came out afterwards that I've kind of tucked away. And I, I'm hoping somebody will, will take this on and rewrite it all later and then I'd be glad to share it with you. But I argue then that uh, they took him out on the stoop and he says then they took him around the house. Um, and this would have been the door, the where he, he, Emma, Emma hears them knocking on the windows because uh, she's awake. And these would have been the windows that they knocked on. The others are way too high for them to have knocked on. And um, then he says they take him out to a meadow. And this is the only meadow in the, uh, in the, uh, the whole area where they could have taken him and it only fits with that account. And so I have suggested that uh, somebody, a good archeologist who wants to go out there with a careful screen and screen all that soil and look for two teeth that are sitting out in the meadow that belonged to Joseph um, could confirm that that was the case. But look through the data yourself and you decide.
uh, which uh, which account or which perspective you think uh, holds a better weight in terms of, of uh, how it fits with what Joseph had to say. Then the third uh, thing I wanted to share from the book uh, was as the book went to press, it ended up getting uh, delayed for a while. Part of it was that um, I had put all my footnotes together at the end of each paragraph so that it wouldn't have lots and lots of footnotes throughout the whole thing. I tried to consolidate that and my editor uh, suggested that I not do that. And so I had to go back and pull all the footnotes back out and attach them to where they belonged. And that took a bit of time, but it also gave me uh, some time uh, in the ensuing year that we waited to take on one aspect of Kirtland that I had not planned on doing because it had nothing to do with any of the sites that we were trying to restore. My assignment was, well, it wasn't actually even an assignment. It was just I decided to take on the buildings that we were restoring and see what I could learn as much as possible about each one so that we, uh, we did the restoration work properly for them. And we weren't addressing the Kirtland Bank at all. But I wanted to understand that whole story. And I was asked to present at a conference on Oliver Cowdery. And he had played a role as the director of a bank in Monroe, Michigan. And so I thought well, that, that works well to try to understand that story in conjunction with Kirtland. What I learned in the process, um, I ended up with six chapters worth of material. And it was only right at the end, as I submitted it all, and it was going to press, I was able to get one more paragraph in that addressed this partly, but I wasn't able to fully flesh this out in the book, unfortunately. And that is that what Joseph was trying to accomplish with the Kirtland Bank was he wanted to build the city of a city of Enoch. Um, a city like Enoch had built, uh, Zion, uh, we'd probably say today, uh, but he was thinking more in terms of, of the city of Enoch. How this came about was he went to uh, New England, uh, Salem, Massachusetts, to, they were trying to find some buried money that they'd heard was buried in a basement of a, of a building. And most people will talk about well, the revelation he received talked about people being the real treasure and indeed uh, people were, but Joseph also learned that there was another way to help get money to build that city of Zion and to just go find it. They have to earn that money. And uh, Oliver Cowdery wrote uh, disparagingly of Wall Street as they walked down this, this street of New York before they went to Salem. Uh, there had been a recent fire, and a part of the city had been, or part of the street had been damaged. This is a, a depiction uh, shortly after that, when there had been the buildings have been reconstructed. So it looks a bit different than it would have looked at the time they went through there. But they were struck by the corruption of finances in the country, and they wanted to do something different. When they came back to Kirtland uh, in the fall of 1836, they began to move toward creating a bank. Over time, it evolved, the name evolves to the Kirtland Safety Society, uh, but the idea is still uh, of a bank. And this is the best photograph. I have another one that is purportedly the bank, but I'm not, I'm not sure, but this is the best photograph I have of the bank you get to see just the corner of it right there beside the temple. And then in the background, you see um, Lyman Johnson and uh, John Boynton's store. And they play an important role in the collapse of the bank, but we won't talk about them today. Other than the bank was designed as a way to help people borrow money to build the community. So they donated, or they didn't donate, they contributed um, their money, their hard currency to the bank. And that hard currency would serve to back these uh, bank notes that then were uh, given out to people as loans and you had to then pay back more than you 
uh, borrowed. <coughs> and over time, um, the idea was that it would build Kirtland, build the community. It was happening all over the, the nation at the time. There was a lot of, it, of excitement about finances. What they were doing was very much like people were doing all around them. Uh, not atypical at all, a very common thing. But there were some distinctive elements of what they were trying to accomplish. And I think that gets at what Joseph was thinking about in terms of that city of Enoch. <laughs> uh, they had 36 stockholders initially who contributed to the company. To the uh, to the bank, most of those were men, but about nine or ten of them. And you go back to get the exact number, but it's I think it's about uh, ten um, were women. Several of them were not members of their community. Um, they were very inclusive. They included people from some other towns. Uh, they included people. Uh, who are wealthy, people who were poor, an ancestor of mine uh, who was getting help from his brother to get along. <clears throat> he he better Methodist minister, uh, Nathan Staker, uh, better Methodist minister in Canada, couldn't even afford <laughs> to take care of his family when he got to Kirtland. Uh, but he, he gets a, a share of stock, not, not much, but he's trying to become a part of this not to make money because one share wouldn't have, but, but to help build the community and support the community. They have a president, uh, Sidney Rigdon, and a cashier, Joseph Smith, and then Warren Parrish is the teller. And then they have seven directors, which is very common. Most banks have a group of directors, sometimes four or five. Um, seven is a, uh, well within the range of a common though. I highlighted uh, four in yellow. Uh, those are the four that, uh, that I knew from the sources. Uh, it's probably uh, Orson Hyde and Neil K. Whitney are directors as well because they play a role in trying to help get things established. And then there's another one. But what's different about this whole endeavor is there's a whole group of managers, uh, 25 additional managers. Um, Wilfred Woodrow says most of the 12 were part of this group, but there were some women. Vienna Jakes was a manager of the bank. <laughs> um, Emma Smith is a manager of the bank. That's unheard of. I could not find another uh, institution anywhere in the country that listed their bank directors that had a, a woman on the board of directors or as a manager or in any kind of a, a operative role at all in the institution. Joseph Smith was unique in that uh, effort. And I think that that gets at part of what he was thinking of in terms of a Zion, of being an inclusive uh, community that, that had a, a role for everyone. Now, as you know, it, uh, it failed. And we don't have time to really go through the, the details of why it failed. I go through that in a whole chapter in the book, uh, but it was largely the Johnson family played a role in that. And then some people outside of the community that contributed to that. I wanted to end on this uh, image. It's a photograph of a replica of a quilt made by uh, Emma Smith. I would love to see the original someday. I've not seen the original, but I'm excited about it because this quilt, in my mind, symbolizes what Kirtland was all about. You may look at this and think, oh, a crazy quilt. And Emma was prescient. You know, that's 40 years before the rest of the country's doing it. Well, it's not a crazy quilt. Um, she's taken and combined an Pennsylvania quilt pattern and an Ohio quilt pattern into one quilt. And so it's her combining her experiences in two locations. I don't know if she made this in Ohio or if she made it later. I'd like to know more about that. But she's taken a diverse set of colors, patterns, sizes of fabric, 
and work them into something that's a unified image that symbolizes the whole of her experience uh, through up through Ohio. And I think that that's really, for me, what Kirtland was all about. It's that tension between the individuals who ended up going their own way and not quite uh, combined as a community and that larger vision of building community and uh, coming together and supporting each other and uh, ultimately having all things in common in different kinds of ways, not necessarily uh, like Black Pete did in the beginning where they all owned the, the same property together, but uh, in terms of that they're working together as a unit to try to build a financial institution and a community that will bless everyone. That captures for me, that, that, that quilt image captures um, what I wanted to leave as a message, which was the importance of coming together and building one image uh, out of many small parts. All right, Mark, well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and for lifting up elements of our history that have been overlooked. Uh, it just, it's incredible to think of African influences in Kirtland religion in the 1830s, um, ways in which the saints were involving women that uh, were ahead of their times. And so I just really appreciate you, you uh, bringing, you know, more awareness to these really important elements of our history. Many, many thanks our friend Mark Staker for sharing his thoughts tonight with us and for sharing his time on all of his research on Kirtland. If you have not purchased a copy of Mark's book, uh, I encourage you to head over to redbrickstore.com to pick up your copy of Harkin OU People. You should see a link appear in the chat for that. And lastly, I hope to see you again on April 14th when we begin the spring lecture series. So in the chat, Locke has shared the link to the spring series where you can learn more about the individual lectures and register. The first lecture in the spring series, one I'm really looking forward to on Mark Forscott is by Eric Paul Rogers. And again, that's April 14th. So we hope to see you all there. Good night. <laughs>